thanks for already uh, starting. Um, I think, Max, you quickly should present uh, yourself once again. We just have heard uh, Sophia. Thomas was also here already. And maybe also for those people who are just uh, joining now, Ma uh, Martin, please also present yourself um, quickly. Oh, thank you, Philip. My name is Max Portenlanger. I'm from Bankhaus von der Heid. Um, we are a fully regulated German bank with a history of over 250 years. And um, now we are dedicated to a, the blockchain technology and one of the leading German banks applying the blockchain technology. I myself, I'm responsible for the structured finance transactions at Bankhaus von der Heid. And there my main two focuses are on the one hand side, the Luxembourg securitization transactions and on the other hand, the tokenization of assets. Excellent. We just uh, have heard your presentation. Um, and then maybe Martin from UpEst, you also quickly present yourself. You're sitting in Berlin right now, if I'm right. I'm sitting in Berlin in my apartment, actually, given the numbers that we have right now in Berlin <laughs> of Corona. Yeah, so my name is Martin, the founder and CEO of UpVest. Um, it's a company based here in Berlin with 30 people. It is a crypto custodian that you actually can plug into your uh, app. So for instance, our clients are Exporo or Bitwaller. We extend our business, not just from, from the custody to a securities trading bank, so a Wertpapier Handelsbank, and then able pretty much then um, many asset managers to pipe cool assets to, to fintechs, not just blockchain assets, by the way, also public market assets to make it really a simple experience um, for the fintechs. Excellent. And now in this panel, we would like to talk about tokenization. So we have Thomas Negele here, um, lawyer in Liechtenstein, co-author of the Liechtenstein Token Act, right? Then we have Martin here, uh, which is providing infrastructure from an IT perspective, but also uh, p becoming or already being a regulated entity in the area of custody in Germany. Then we have uh, Sophia uh, here, you just uh, have heard um, her presentation, tokenizing all kinds of assets, especially shares. And we have Max here also from a regulated entity, which is in this case uh, the Bankhaus uh, von der Heide, which you could call a crypto bank in Germany, right? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. That's, uh, and we would like to talk about tokenization, and therefore we had our uh, call yesterday um, to prepare this, and we first want to define what exactly is tokenization. It's a buzzword already, and we first have to clearly define uh, what is it, uh, who wants to give it a start, really defining exactly, very precisely, how, what exactly is tokenization. Maybe the lawyer, Thomas, uh, is <laughs> the best one, especially that, that, with the actually, token container model. I, I don't know if it's a good idea if you want to have an easy description, if you want to have a precise one, that's a different story. I think uh, what I just uh, did within my talk, um, you can have actually uh, several definitions of tokenization of assets because there is no, uh, as, as with a lot of terms in the blockchain industry, uh, there, people are having different meanings about that. Um, so let's, uh, let's give you the answer for, for Liechtenstein. What we understand when it comes to tokenization of assets is um, that you have an asset and um, you will use technology, uh, a blockchain system, DLT system, whatsoever, uh, to let that, to let the token represent that asset. Because in the end, uh, what we say is the asset still exists. So your your shares, for example, they still exist. Your ownership right still exists. What you do is you just actually. Uh, put that ownership right into a token and make it actually easily tradable on a blockchain system. That's what we understand about tokenization. I think that's, uh, that's a f exactly a very precise uh, definition, definitely. I will uh, summarize it. Um, and the key point here, what I heard uh, from Thomas, is it's basically a digital representation of a right so in case, and that's very important because we typically say, you also use the words, we are tokenizing assets, we are tokenizing shares. That's not what we do. We are tokenizing rights on something. And that's interesting from a share perspective. I think we talked about it yesterday. Uh, an asset, for example, creates multiple rights and each right would ideally be tokenized itself such that an asset creates multiple 
tokens, right? You want to add on this, for, for example, with regard to debt tokens, equity tokens, and so on? Yeah, definitely. And we, when we talk about the asset, which should be tokenized, it's also quite interesting to think about why should it be tokenized? Who wants to purchase this asset? And um, how will this asset be more efficiently when it's tokenized? We, for example, as a fully regulated bank, can also act as a security trust, trustee for assets, and we can also tokenize the rights um, which are granted as a security trustee, what makes also quite uh, some in, um, transactions quite interesting. On the other hand, um, I quite often see transactions, securitization transactions, where we create notes which are classified as debt instruments, and one um, quite current project from our side is to tokenize the securitization transaction to get this transaction more efficient on the one hand, but also keep it in the well-known legal framework for the classical investors, for the institutional investors on the other hand. And, uh, securitizing what exactly? Um, we will uh, use not only the law of 2004 for unregulated securitization transactions in Luxembourg, but we will also use the law of 2019 on dematerialized securities, and we will not have the gl classical global certificate, but we will then have the global certificate in a tokenized form, and by this um, we can offer as a fully regulated bank all services from one hand and be real-time on the market with the securitization transaction. What makes it quite interesting for investors and sponsors which do not have the time to wait four or six weeks until all involved parties are ready. So this is tokenizing uh, uh, Tokenize. securitization? Yeah, so. like tokenizing structured finance. Okay, excellent. That's another point. Um, Martin, what uh, in your software which you are operating, what kinds of tokens are being stored there or custodied already there right now or will be stored there in the future? Do, are there any clusters emerging, say equity tokens, debt tokens, uh, sec um, securitization tokens, I don't know, real, um, real asset tokens? Yeah, it's a good question. I would love to have equity tokens actually in Germany. Unfortunately, it's not like Liechtenstein. <laughs> um, no, I think this is not possible. So we see actually is, so it started with real estate. So you see a lot of real estate actually there as an asset class, but it's not really a real security. It's pretty much more a profit participation in that regard. What we see right now, a lot of things that happen are certificates being tokenized, either certificates of a fund or certificates of any type of asset. Um, which is then also put into a token. We have talked with a couple of partners that actually wanted to tokenize debt, but then it's a little bit the question of what the value of that is. And one of the challenges we always see is that, um, especially on Ethereum, you cannot put a lot of these property rights and clauses into the token itself. So you just have the token representing another contract um, that is laying somewhere else, either in paper form or digitally. So one of the cool things that we probably have to do in the future, maybe it is already the case in Liechtenstein, is to connect the token also to some way of paper that you can sign digitally, because then actually you have the whole trail of the token to the legal work. Um, and this is currently missing, in Germany at least. That's why most of these structures are just a representation of something, and you always have some trustee or partly market maker that actually has to cover up um, in case the shit hits the fan. Yeah? Okay. Um, and Sophia, what, what other assets uh, would be tokenized? I think after hearing a lot of um, current presentations about the topic tokenization, I think the question is clear, okay, we can tokenize, we can tokenize debt securities in Germany, we can do equity in Liechtenstein. I think the question is um, what the, the market is demanding. We can tokenize everything, but what is the market demanding is I think the best uh, question we can hear. Are these exotic assets? Do, do the people want to go beyond the traditional ETF or asset um, structures? Do they want to, I don't know, tokenize maybe art, tokenize a piece of land? I think these are important questions um, also to consider in this um, discussion. Absolutely. So uh, we see here it's a very broad field. Maybe, Thomas, do you see any uh, very exotic assets these days uh, where people come to Liechtenstein and say, I would like to tokenize, I don't know, receivables or uh, ownership paper. rights on cars or car registers uh, or any other things? Um, 
I mean, yes, what, what we see is uh, cars, uh, art, uh, but I don't think that this is um, very special, to be very honest. I think, um, and let me, let me come back to, to, the, uh, to, to what Martin just said. I, I think what is interesting is that um, if, you, if you start from scratch and if you think of how it actually should be when you talk about tokenization of assets, so you let the token represent whatever right, the way it should be is that you don't have to issue a certificate first and then to find whatever solution that this certificate is represented by a token, then you can use the blockchain system again. Actually, if you start from scratch, what you would do is, and that what Liechtenstein actually done with, uh, with unregistered securities, so if you found your uh, um, limited company in Liechtenstein, what you can actually do is you can issue tokens which are actually your shareholder rights, represented shareholder rights, and you are able to actually uh, have a registry on a blockchain system. So from minute one, from second one, you have a digital token representing your shareholder rights. So there's no way of securitization, paper, and then dematerializing, put it in custody, and then having it in a digital way. And I think we should, that should be the goal. We should get rid of intermediaries where we don't need them anymore. And then we open up for a lot of other um, uh, assets. And you, you ask me what are assets which are actually unusual. I think every asset which, uh, which is just from a value point of view, uh, it doesn't make sense uh, to, to actually put a wrapper around it and an SPV and then you issue shares. Um, because uh, this, this will not happen because it's too, too cost intensive. What we will see is and that that's what we see now is that you have, let's say, a $100,000 worth uh, old timer uh, and you can actually tokenize the ownership right of that, uh, uh, that old timer directly. So you have a, a token representing the ownership right or a friction of it. And that's actually huge because you reduce the cost and the time involved rapidly. That's, that's really amazing, I think. Okay, so if we now make a list, what can you tokenize already? We had heard uh, debt instruments in Germany. This has been done last year already. Then we have heard about uh, securitizations and its tokenization. Then we heard about equity in Liechtenstein. Um, how does this list continue? It, at the end of the day, we would like to tokenize everything, everywhere, but at this point of time, we have a discrete list what's possible and what not. What have we missed so far? Any other things what is possible to tokenize already? Or what has been tokenized? Um, Martin, um, real estate, that's uh, again debt I personally think you, yeah, real estate is a huge one, uh, but I fully agree actually with Thomas. Um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to put a wrapper around this and to have this counterparty risk because then you build up just more intermediaries. So the question is, that theoretically, you can tokenize everything, everything, even my, my bicycle behind me can be tokenized and I can sell it somewhere, but then you have to trust me this bicycle exists. So I think the, the legal framework is indeed actually the, the missing point, at least in Germany. And you have to start from scratch that everything that you put into code or into this token is um, supported by your, your legislation. If that is not the case, then you will always have the counterparty risk, which actually is against the whole blockchain philosophy, right? So um, I think this is the missing piece where we probably have to talk about in a certain direction, will this ever happen in Germany? Or will this be eventually just something that Liechtenstein can do? Um, I would prefer to also have it on a European level because indeed, then you could also take your house or I can, can take my apartment wrap this on, don't even wrap it actually, just launch this directly on a blockchain and can sell it maybe on a secondary market because it represents my real apartment without actually putting it into an SPV and uh, filing a prospectus, which is indeed super, super complicated. Okay, M Martin, as I said, and uh, Philip, you might remember last week when uh, Joachim Schwerin was in Liechtenstein talking about uh, Mika and uh, the pilot regime. Uh, he, he used a slide, and I used it in my presentation as well. I, uh, I, I just had a screenshot of that, actually, uh, that uh, he said that uh, the European Commission is setting the lights 
to green when it comes to the token economy. So uh, it, that's the first step. Like what we see with Mika and the pilot regime is the first step to a fully tokenized economy. So hopefully we will see that uh, this is, and I mean, I think we all agree um, that it's nice that if Liechtenstein has such a, a legislation, but you need a, a bigger market. And when it comes to secondary market, which is one of my favorite topics, there for sure, I mean, if we talk about liquidity, you need a bigger market, that, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. And that's why, therefore, we anyway need a harmonized approach. But like since some weeks now, since uh, the Mika was actually published, um, I'm, I'm quite confident uh, that we will have a good solution for Europe. I think what you're pointing out is extremely important. We really have to keep the time dimension in mind. Some of these uh, ideas uh, will just be possible in two, three years. Others, we just listed them, are already happening uh, now. Uh, you have tokenized equity, right, and shares. Yeah, we also have um, already tokenized mezzanine debt for real estates. Um, this is a tokenized transaction for, um, according to the German law. Okay. May Maybe let's talk a little bit more about um, tokenization versus uh, securitization. Uh, it's not easy to basically disentangle these uh, words. Um, how would you divide it? Uh, or how is this overlapping? Well, maybe I can start from this perspective of Germany and Luxembourg. Um, in the Luxembourg securitization transaction, we always use an insolvency remote SPV. And first of all, those assets need to be um, brought into the SPV. And afterwards, the SPV issues a bond um, used to refinance the purchase of the assets. And investors purchasing the bond participate in the P&L of the SPV. Um, there we have the classical paper form um, where we sign the contracts and investors sign their agreement to purchase the bond. On the tokenization, I understand that there, there is a, um, some legal framework and from this legal framework we take out any rights where investors are willing to participate and all the rights and belong, um, who, the, uh, who is the owner of the rights are, um, are kept in a digital layer in the DLT. And, and what is the key benefit? You are basically shrinking the time it needs uh, for secur securitization and then apparently also the costs, right? Definitely, definitely. And I think there we are exactly talking about the same as well as in securitization transactions as well as in tokenization transactions. As soon as we have harmonized standards and all market participants are speaking the same language, all from the investors to the initiators of the transaction. Everybody knows how to um, tokenize, how to securitize, and according to which standards. I think then the transaction costs um, are shrinking, and furthermore, when we use the tokenization for securitization transactions, then we need to coordinate way less parties. We can do real-time transactions and also real-time issues of bonds. And I think that's a great advantage to combine both. Okay, and does it also apply to you? Yes, so when we see the Liechtenstein perspective here, I also talked about that we can tokenize um, um, startups, so um, their shares. And I think that's um, also a completely new, to, new perspective to see that. That is also possible to the restrictions because um, the Liechtenstein law was introducing that. And um, I think the benefit of it is, of course, what you also mentioned, the time constraint. So what we are promising is that um, Amazing Block Solutions, that we can do it within four weeks. Why? Because we did it with our own business model. We know what the necessary steps are. And what we also did, so a few days um, ago, we did the first share transfer between shareholders, and that between some minutes. So you see that unnecessary steps are then completely fallen away. We have efficiency, we, have, uh, we can save a lot of time. And I think that's all about it, especially in times of Corona. You don't want to travel, you want to do it um, in front of your laptop. And I think um, that's all about it. Okay. And Max, can you mention some numbers, you know, like uh, shrinking the time you need for a securitization Definitely. from two? 
Definitely. When we talk about securitization transaction, the first thing we start is we um, check the assets, and I think that's also quite important for tokenization transaction. How is it possible to get the value of those underlying assets? Um, because that's exactly what the investors want, and as an initiator of a securitization transaction or a token, we need to have a robust valuation of the asset. After we have solved this, and this can take um, like one day or not even one day when they say, okay, we have um, audited financial statements and that's it. Or we have a liquid um, quote of the assets which we securitize. That's quite easy. But we can also have some discussions which can take up to several weeks. Usually it takes several days or one day. Then we um, prepare the legal documents and the legal documents for securitization transactions if they are the classical securitization transactions, um, it's also not too difficult. We can do it within one week, um, prepare the documents, check it with our legal um, for a sanity check, and then we can proceed with the transaction. So those are approximately one and a half week. And from our side now, we would be ready to go and all the documentations are finalized. But then it starts with the involved parties, like the paying agent and Clearstream. And this usually up to, uh, takes well, four weeks, sometimes three weeks, sometimes five weeks. And that's exactly this part which we could cut off when we would tokenize it and offer everything out of one hand. Maybe I need to add that um, we as a fully regulated bank have a small advantage there that we can do the cash on-ramp. Else it might be quite difficult to get the cash in this tokenized transaction, but as we are a fully regulated German bank, we can on-ramp the cash and afterwards everything is tokenized and the um, issue of the token takes from the legal documentation and coordination with investors. I would say realistically one or two weeks, technically it's real time. So it's a significant decrease, it's not... Definitely, uh, uh, and that's sometimes quite interesting for the sponsors or the um, initiators of the transaction, because I uh, frequently have the situation that there is an investor saying, hey, I would like to purchase this ad asset, this strategy, but um, I need it securitized, I can't purchase it like this. I can't purchase a plain asset, I need to have a VKN and an ISIN. And the other side says, yes, I will prepare it for you. And now there are several million or several 10 million euros waiting just for the parties to get coordinated. And this would be my vision to have this real time and to give those parties a solution to say, yes, you know the asset, you want to make business. So we make you able to make the business now and not in two months. Yeah, that's an interesting vision. Do you want to add something, Thomas? Yes, Or? Philip. Uh, because what I think here, uh, what we will see on a European level, let, let me just uh, put that slide here again, because I didn't uh, touch base on that uh, in my speech. But that's huge. Now we heard uh, that uh, it, it will take days, actually, and, uh, you, you, and, and then you have the initial recording of that uh, digital security. When we have that pilot regime, it's a draft only now, I know, on a European level. But what is the concept if, is that you have then a, a, an MTF, a multilateral trading facility, which is actually able to provide initial recording, settlement, safekeeping, out of one license, it's one entity with the use of a blockchain system, and then you have initial recording of a security within minutes, and it's tradable on a secondary market. And I think that's where we are going now. We don't talk about days or weeks of settlement. We, we, we talk about initial recording within minutes, and it's fully tradable on a secondary market. And I think that's really, really huge for Europe. So, so you would also argue that, um, now talking about the life cycle uh, of assets, um, that what you mentioned here is that the EU regime, the planned pilot regime, right, um, is a perfect later life cycle for those tokenized assets uh, in an earlier stage um, which are issued, right? So this is what we are seeing here at the horizon is a very interesting life cycle issuing the asset somewhere, I don't know, Liechtenstein elsewhere, and later on trading it on an EU-wide uh, trading venue, right? Is this what you mean? 
I think for now uh, we can say, okay, the European Commission made their homework. They analyzed what is the, the showstopper when it comes to the secondary market of security tokens first. So they addressed these issues. They, they have that draft of the pilot regime, but that's the first step because the pilot regime, the idea with that is like to learn if that's the way of doing it, you know? But it is a really very huge, big first step. But for sure, there will be more steps needed to have the fully European capital market on a whatever digital solution, let's say a DLT uh, system. But it's a first big step towards that direction, and I think that is really huge. Um, Martin, would you agree with this, that you also see the European developments quite um, positive and maybe surprisingly positive? Uh, yeah, for sure. I'm also surprised about Germany sometimes, about the legislation. Uh, a lot of things happened there recently. So uh, we started a company three years ago and a lot of things we didn't expect. We thought actually US and Asia will be, will be faster uh, in terms of legislation, but it's the other way around. Um, <clears throat> I think when you look at the European level, there's always a trend for harmonization. And um, these countries try since five, ten, maybe more years to harmonize the whole settlement and custody regime. Um, and also the taxes in that, that regard, which is super complicated and they could, couldn't really achieve this because they don't really have an open securities market in Europe only for very liquid assets. And I think they want to break this further down and to have this harmonization across Europe. And that's exactly, I think, where the blockchain will also outperform a traditional ledger solution because this way you actually can transfer on these assets from one country to the other instantly. Um, you can create like a pan-European market or pan-European liquidity compared to, let's say, ledger-to-ledger -ledger liquidity. Yeah. Sounds fascinating. So it, it feels like a huge, uh, shiny puzzle, which will be looking nice at some point of time. And right now we are f having the first little pieces and starting to, to plug them together. And it will take a couple of, I don't know, years uh, until this uh, puzzle will be done. We are actually, myself, not hearing much from Luxembourg. Maybe you can give us some insights of what's going on there. Um, uh, they are not too positive about crypto assets, as far as I know, but please uh, yeah, help definitely. us hear how to interpret what's going on there. Not too much or oh, maybe much? Um, about crypto assets, especially about cryptocurrencies. That's a project where uh, I worked on in 2018, um, securitizing crypto assets in Luxembourg. And um, I can only um, repeat what you said. Yes, they were not too happy about this. And that's why we said, OK, um, we need to wait a bit um, until it's the right time to make to securitize crypto assets. Now, um, I think there's um, one pain point of, uh, of the CSF in Luxembourg with the cryptocurrencies. They say, hey, what happens if you securitize them and afterwards they are stolen? And then um, you have a compartment and afterwards, hey, the investors lost their money. So what do you do now? And that's exactly where um, we as Fondheit um, there are also um, several capital marks in the Luxembourg Capital Marks Association, and that's also where we want to work on um, to get our standard to uh, securitize crypto assets. And those should be the highest level of security, like fully regulated crypto custody, what we could do as Bankers Fondheit as we have the crypto custody license, and then the um, cryptocurrencies stored in a a fully licensed custodian. There we have the regulatory security that um, the regulators say, okay, there is somebody having the certificate. Hey, why should I intervene? And these parties ensure that the crypto assets are not stolen. And as soon as we start there, I think there is the point to start to get uh, Luxembourg more keen to crypto assets to start with the full security. And afterwards, everybody gets familiar with these assets and says, hey, those assets are good assets. There are some pension funds or some other funds who would like to have a Excuse really, me? really small amount of crypto Excuse assets me? there. Yes. I'm sorry to uh, have to interrupt, but we are a little bit over the time already. Um, I would, no worries, we can continue yes, this I would, outside. I, would, I have to ask to uh, pack up. Yeah. Uh, we are closing this discussion, and uh, so we see Luxembourg is also moving. It is That's, moving, yes. I'm, I'm curious when we are um, securitizing tokens and then tokenize the securitized tokens. I also heard this approach, <laughs> and the reason is there was somebody saying, 
that's a tokenized asset, I would like to purchase it, but it doesn't work from a regulatory perspective. Could you securitize it? I, I had this case. Okay, then let's see when this happens. Okay, thanks very much. And um, by the way, we have now the final presentation coming up from uh, Max, and then we are closing this day. Uh, thanks, by the way, at this point of time uh, for the people doing the technology and the recording up there, which works uh, extremely well.